Rachel, here we are, week four. Uh, as usual on a Monday, we've got a lot to get through from the weekend and this morning. Try as the two main parties might. Really, it's all about reform today, isn't it? Yeah, today is reform day, definitely. And we're recording this. We've just seen Nigel Farage deliver the party's not manifesto manifesto because uh, he's calling it a contract. Why so? Uh, a contract with the people. Yes, he says that uh, other parties have manifestos and uh, the public are very used to manifesto commitments quickly being broken. He said... Uh, in word association terms, you hear the word manifesto and you immediately think lie. And that's why it's a contract with the people instead. But it's a, also not a manifesto in another way, in that Farage was very clear about the fact that this is not a platform for government because his party is not even pretending that it has a hope of possibly being in government, uh, at least not in this election. It's about laying the groundwork possibly for uh, the way they will challenge Labour. This comes down to reform, trying to sell this idea that re reform is effectively the opposition or will effectively be the opposition. And so they don't need a platform for government. They need a platform for how they're going to try and set the agenda as one of the opposition parties. Before we go through what they have said or what they haven't as well, it was a really mixed weekend for the party, wasn't it? Because we had an extraordinary poll on the front page of the Sunday Times, which had them winning seven seats uh, come election day. Now, it's one poll, as we've learned, we've had drummed into us by Ben Walker, and I'm sure he'll have something to say on that later in the week. But we've also had scandal, I don't know if that's the right word, but we've had one of their candidates, Grant St. Clair Armstrong, standing down in Kemi Badenoch's seat. This is a, a new seat because of boundary changes, Northwest Essex, over some posts that he made about a decade ago where he suggested people vote BMP, the British National Party. Um, plenty of sort of unsavoury comments found elsewhere on that blog as well. Yeah, it he also made uh, some racial slurs about Chinese and Pakistani people, jokes about women. It's funny how often uh, racial slurs and misogynistic slurs seem to go together. Uh, and particularly on the Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq war, he wrote, the simple solution is to extradite Blair and his hideous bag of a wife of the odious Alistair Campbell to a country that routinely indulges in torture and execution. Then hopefully we will never hear about them again. So you get, you get the gist from all that. We've had actually talked on this podcast right at the beginning about the uh, struggle that all the parties would face uh, in terms of vetting 600 candidates uh, and that past social media comments and past blog posts were inevitably going to come out. I think we were talking about it in terms of Conservatives and Labour, obviously reform as a, as a new party, having to get those candidates together, not being able to fall back on people like local councillors or people who have been engaged in the party for quite some time have suddenly got this job of doing a, a huge amount of vetting. Um, but as you say, the, the candidates, uh, names have already been sent in. He will be on the ballot paper, uh, but it does give Kemi Badenoch a slightly easier ride if reform don't direct resources into that seat. Yeah, I mean, it's worth adding. He's apologised and he says, look, I can't stand by those comments. There's no excuse for them. All the parties have had some difficulties with candidate selection, but there does seem to be a particular issue here. I mean, last week on the podcast, Andrew and I spoke about Ian Gribben, another reform candidate who had spoken about the UK being wrong to fight against Hitler in the Second World War, that we should have been neutral, uh, and some, again, vile misogynistic comments. And then the Times had an extraordinary scoop at the weekend, suggesting that one in 10 or nearly one in 10 reform candidates were Facebook friends with the gentleman who is the leader of the UK fascists at the moment. I mean, that's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, I think uh, with fringe parties uh, that have a, a populist anti-establishment bent, as it were, you are more likely to attract an eccentric a group of characters, shall we say. I, actually, for people, I'm not going to repeat it, but uh, go and read uh, the apology of Grant Sinclair Armstrong <laughs> in full because he says a number of other things uh, to sort of support his his change of heart that our listeners might find interesting. I'm going to have to tell them which what one of those <laughs> is, which is 
I have many Muslim friends, three of whom call me daddy. Who are not his children, shall we so, say. Yeah, it's yeah. odd. Uh, it, 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 it is indeed. Um, moving swiftly on. <laughs> <laughs> moving swiftly on. I mean, is, is this part of the territory, though? Because obviously the more successful, the, the, the better it seems reform do in the polls, the more scrutiny, rightly so, that they come under. Yeah, and I think uh, it's right that they come under more scrutiny and we're going to be going through their not manifesto with a fine tooth comb uh, in a moment. Um, but the other thing you've got to remember about reform and candidate elections is it's not a party in the normal sense. It doesn't have members in the usual sense. They don't have kind of a code of conduct or uh, a party infrastructure. It's a it's it's a limited company owned by in the majority by Nigel Farage. People who sign up to be uh, reform members are just kind of paying subscriptions. They're not getting sort of membership in return. So a, a, again, your selection pool when it comes to a party like that is going to be slightly different to a, a mainstream political party. Well, and it's interesting, Nigel Farage when interviewed this morning, said that they had paid uh, a third party company to perform the vetting and they'd given them a lot of money to do so. And in fact, they hadn't. And he would be giving us more details about that in the coming days. So, so something has Watch happened this space. or not happened. Watch this space, indeed. So on to the contract non-manifesto launch. Uh, you mentioned right at the top of the podcast, they're saying... They know they're not going to be government, but Farage also saying he wants to be prime minister come 2029. Can't see it happening, but there you go. Um, why Merthyr Tidfil? He's in Wales launching the contract. That was a really interesting choice. I think there were two reasons for that location. One is that uh, Wales voted for Brexit very strongly. And obviously, reform isn't just the Brexit party, but that is the support base that they are building on. And the other one comes back to what I was saying at the beginning about uh, reform's pitch really being, we want to be an effective opposition to Labour. And uh, Wales has had a Labour government uh, and has a Labour government at, at the moment. And so choosing to launch your contract somewhere where the uh, vote for change, as it were, going towards Labour isn't so straightforward actually makes sense. Farage's point was that uh, even if the Liberal Democrats do very well uh, and get a high number of seats, they are quite similar to Labour in a lot of their policy. So you can't expect effective opposition from them. You can't expect effective opposition from the Conservatives because they're just fighting each other. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and therefore, if you want to hold Labour to account and in Wales, holding Labour to account is a, is, is a present challenge, not just a, a future one, then consider voting for reform. On the Conservatives fighting each other, really interesting that he he mentioned uh Suella Bravman suggesting in Farage's words a uh, proposal of marriage as it were a merger between the conservatives and reform at the same time as David Cameron is is back being very disparaging about Nigel Farage and reform so he used that as a sign of divisions within the Conservative Party. I think he's absolutely right about the Conservative Party being divided on reform, but it does show the dangers of Tories taking the Suella Bravman line and going, well, maybe if we just inch a little bit closer to reform, they'll be nicer to us, because it's very, very clear that those kinds of overtures will be something Farage takes and gleefully uses against the Conservatives. But he is loving this, isn't he? Oh, Nigel yeah. Farage. Oh, yeah. It's exactly what he wants. Everybody talking about him, fighting over him. And you can tell he's just absolutely relishing this campaign. And the, 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 uh, the almost, you know, writing off the Conservatives, which obviously he probably hasn't, but that's, that's the whole thing about being in Merthyr Tidville, I guess, as well, saying that the, t the Tories are irrelevant. But having everybody talk about him, that's exactly what he wants. Yeah, he, he started off by going, guess who's back, back again, which is uh, a throwback to the viral TikTok video he did of him rapping, I guess, if you can call it rapping, uh, it, 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 in a car. But yeah, he's, he's loving the attention uh, and he is loving the uh, chance to 
really lead the conversation again after having been quite irrelevant really for the last couple of years up until now. Turning to the plan, let's start with tax because some incredibly bold statements here. Increasing the minimum income tax threshold to £20,000, the higher rate threshold from £50,000 to £70,000, even more generous on stamp duty than we saw from the Conservatives and uh, big changes on inheritance tax too. How on earth are they going to fund that? Oh, through cuts to government waste, obviously, Hannah. I can't believe I can't believe you don't have fifty faith billion that there is that there is fifty billion in, in government waste down the back of the sofa. Be ambitious. Look, tax cuts are popular. Like the idea of people paying less tax, most people are kind of quite keen on the idea of paying less tax. But the, the benefits of being a party that explicitly said it won't be in government is you can afford to be a bit more creative when it comes to how you pay for it. But they have they have produced a costings document. And the costings document is like an Excel table that has sort of three lines of savings here, five billion here, 10 billion there in the vaguest of vague terms. I, I love this kind of convention now where parties are going to be very serious with a fully costed document other than the, the document itself is in fact fiction. But we're laughing about it. Um, is anyone, can you see anyone really believing it? Because the, the narrative in, during this campaign really has been that, that neither Labour nor the Conservatives are really being truthful with the public when it comes to the state of the public finances. And this ruling out tax cuts, it, it just doesn't add up economically. We've heard that time and time again. And then to have reform saying that they can do all this where none of the other parties can, is anybody going to buy that? I think reform are counting on the fact that people feel that taxes are very high, which they are, and also feel that public services are falling apart, uh, which they also are. And there is a justifiable confusion, frustration in the electorate that, hang on, I don't understand how my taxes can be higher than they used to be, but public services can be falling apart more than they used to be. Now, there are lots of lots of reasons for that. Some of them structural, some of them to do with COVID, some of them to do with global forces, some of them to do with mismanagement, some of them a lot to do with growth and debt and interest. There are reasons for that. But I think honing in on that disconnect uh, is a compelling message. So is anyone going to take it seriously? Well, people who sit down with the spreadsheets and, and, and look at the proposed fiscal plans, no. But people who feel inherently that something has gone wrong and they're not getting value for money, I think that that, that, that will resonate, actually. You mentioned public services. Nigel Farage is criticised quite often. It's claimed, at least, that he wants to privatise the NHS. What, what are reforms saying on the National Health Service? So uh, Farage has talked about uh, moving towards a social insurance kind of model, which uh, any time that gets mentioned, people do fear privatisation. And I think uh, it'll be really interesting to see if reform can get away with making that argument in a way that when Conservatives and indeed people from Labour, like when Wes Streeting talks about reform of the NHS, he also gets hit with the criticisms, the, the panic about selling it. So uh, we know the NHS is, is hugely popular, especially among people who might be tempted to vote for reform. So it'd be really, really interesting to see if that kind of scaremongering Farage wants to sell off the NHS that other politicians have faced. Can he brush that off in a way that he's brushed off other criticisms? Or is that going to be a sticking point. Um, but one of the part of the reforms that, that he is suggesting is exempting two million uh, health and social care workers from paying the basic rate of income tax that goes back to, well, you're going to get less tax revenue then. And that's all quite confusing. Um, patients to receive a voucher for fully funded private treatment if they cannot see their GP within three days. That's going to be quite contentious. Uh, a 20% tax relief on private healthcare and insurance, bringing the, the 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 private healthcare sector into the NHS in a way, as it as it were. Um, I mean, again, the cost of that. Oh, but it's all going to be funded by uh, moving the Bank of England debt to 75-year bonds and scrapping the interest rate that lenders earn on deposits. 
This is a really interesting one. This is something that actually some relatively serious people in the uh, economic establishment world, Charlie Bean, a former deputy governor of the Bank of England, have uh, actually raised the prospect of Chris Giles and the FT too. Yeah, Andrew was talking about it last week as well in his essay, wasn't he, in the magazine? Yeah, this is a this is a, a kind of serious idea that looks at the the way quantitative easing was done and uh, now the the interest rate that is paid on. Uh, private lenders that, that bought government bonds. Um, Will Dunn has a really good explainer uh, on the New Statesman website today as to why this isn't the magic money tree that uh, some are claiming that it might be. But it is it is a serious idea and variations of it have been tried in other countries, uh, notably producing far less than the billions reform are saying it would. But I think watch out for that idea because that idea is probably likely to to come back in some form, at least when it comes to being debated. And reform have wanted to make this the immigration election. What was said on this core platform that they like to run on? One in, one out. Uh, when I interviewed uh, Richard Tice, who was the leader of reform until Nigel Farage <laughs> decided to come back, uh, when I interviewed him in the autumn, he talked about uh, that the only the only net zero Britain should have would be a net zero on immigration. So one in, one out. And Farage today raised all the points that you would expect about uh, housing shortages, about the uh, the fact that. Uh, investment in public services uh, and, uh, and and other areas haven't kept up with the rate of immigration, which is true. We're not building nearly enough houses, and he made it all sound very very reasonable. But 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 nothing in there about uh, how y- you would handle sudden shortages of workers in in key industries across the board. Uh, he, he makes it he makes it all sound very very easy, and I think the people who are likely to be attracted by that kind of offering are the ones who think it, it should be easy some way. Um, but obviously, if it if it were, then Conservative governments over the last 14 years would have managed to get net migration at least moving in the direction they wanted it to, if not coming down to, to low levels. And obviously, they've done the opposite. So maybe it's just a little bit harder than Nigel Farage makes out. Anything else stand out? Uh I love the fact that Farage got to do the the fun bit of talking about all the great plans reform has. And then when it came to, in his words, the, the nasty bit, how are we going to pay for it? Uh, he just handed over to, to Richard Tice. I find their dynamic absolutely fascinating. Um, the kind of Farage is a superstar and, 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 and Tice is kind of the world weary stage manager trying to sort of pick up the pieces and make it all fit together. I also love the fact that Farage said he was a, a Johnny come lately to the manifesto document, um, whilst brandishing it. And obviously it has his face on it. So that was amusing for me.